I'm one of the founders, actually, and a senior partner with OCNC Strategy Consultants. For those of you who don't know us, we're a strategic advisory firm. Uh, I, I founded it 31 years ago. We have 14 offices now around the world, something like 600 consultants, uh, and we work with large corporations, with investors, with governments, and, and with NGOs on strategy. Um, in my spare time beyond that, I'm also a, a board director of Barclays UK. Uh, I'm chair of the charity Fair Trade. I'm chair of uh, ITAD, which is a consulting firm in international development. Uh, and I'm also an advisor to His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales on some matters, including being chairman of his organic food brand, Dutchy Originals. Um, but I don't speak in any of those capacities today. Um, I speak to you uh, as a businessman. I speak to you as a charity volunteer uh, and as a citizen of the United Kingdom. And I think that, is it, that bit is important because I think we're, we're very lucky to live in this country uh, it's a country which has enjoyed stability of political and personal freedom for a long time, uh, perhaps longer than anywhere else. It's quite normal if you live in this country to think of our traditions of liberty going all the way back to the Saxon era and being formed through Magna Carta uh, and then developed through resistance to Charles I and the glorious revolution uh, and it's normal to think of those liberties coming up to the present day through parliamentary reform and through universal suffrage. And there's perhaps, therefore, a thousand years of perspective on what it means to make progress towards a modern liberal democracy. And that's important if you're, if you're British. But recently, obviously, we're here today because we've had two referendums, in fact. We had the Scottish referendum uh, in 2014, which put the very shape of the United Kingdom at stake. And then we had the 2016 Brexit referendum, which has opened huge questions about Britain's role and relationship to the world. I think one of, one of the very positive aspects of this country, one of the very uh, re reinforcing uh, aspects of its long-standing stability has really been the potential in this country for us to be patriotic without being nationalistic. Um, I think we've had a, a common good, if you like, which has been quite plural and quite inclusive. But if you look at those two referendums, what they seem to have unleashed is a quite nasty polarization of public discourse. Not just between yes and no in the case of the Scottish referendum or leave and remain in the case of Brexit, but if you look at this country both domestically and, and actually internationally from the perspective of the world, we seem as a consequence of those referendums to have descended into a national nervous breakdown. So these are quite unsettling times, but also very, very important times and quite vital times. And that's why uh, I, as well as the, the two speakers who follow me, Filippo Clare and Tom Holland, uh, have become members of a forum called These Islands. And this forum, These Islands, stands for the view that more unites the nations of the United Kingdom than divides them. And we also believe that good relations on these islands are very important, more important, in fact, now than ever to work for in, in, in the wake of Brexit. And indeed, we don't exclude quite widely differing views on Brexit. Although I have to say personally, and I, I share this with a lot of members of these islands, you, you can't avoid observing that we are a union ourselves that for 300 years in the case of the union between England and Scotland, or much longer in the, in the case of the union between England and Wales, we have had a very successful single market, a very successful customs union, a very successful pooling of citizenship, even a single currency, in fact. And it seems odd, to me at least, therefore, 
that as an example of a very successful union in our own nation, we have been unwilling or unable to accept and participate in a much milder form of pooling of sovereignty in the European project. But in these islands, above all else, we're a group that believes that these rifts, this polarization, which has been exposed by these two referendums, is only going to be he healed by informed and respectful and constructive debate. That's what we want to promote. And in particular, we wish to bring a robust understanding of the relevant facts to that debate. And I, I think thinking in that way exposes actually a, a deeply unsatisfactory aspect of both referendum debates. And that is that the, the public and the political argument has been largely cast in economic terms. When the, the, the best argument that you heard on the no side of the Scottish referendum was that the average household in Scotland would be 500 pounds a year worse off, then you know that something, is, something fundamental is quite missing from the debate. Something deeply important is being ignored. Equally, the Brexit debate, at times it really did come down to project fear. It came down to this point that the barrier to us being able to export to the EU will be costly. And while I think that is true, and I'll talk about it more, one has to feel that we are missing something more important, that we're missing an opportunity to explore and to debate what is Britain's role on the world stage and what sort of country we want to be. Certainly, I'm not dismissing the economic arguments. They are critical, and I'll come back to them, particularly since they've been traduced in the argument by appearing on the side of buses and so on. But much more than those is at stake. I think you often hear about Britain being cast as a nation which is in long-term decline, a nation which is kind of struggling to accommodate itself to a reduced standing in global rankings, uh, and I don't think that's the case. I think Britain has, or had at least up until now, found a new role for itself. I think it had established itself as a country which is, if you look at it internationally, is quite warmly respected, and particularly respected for its, its vibrancy, its culture, its entrepreneurialism, and its openness. Britain's global perception, and if you travel the world as I do and talk to people, you hear that perception is as an exemplar of liberty and democracy. And I don't believe I need to tell you that because I'm quite conscious and indeed honored that I'm in a room where people, unlike myself, a majority of you have actually chosen to be here and have actually chosen to call this country your residence. That's quite humbling for those of us um, who are speaking here as people born in Britain. So I don't think I really need to implore you to consider what is at stake in these debates, not just economically, but also culturally and politically. You probably feel it even more acutely than I do. But let's look at that. Let's look in particular at what's at stake culturally. I think Britain's culture has enormous global reach and penetration. To give you an example, 31 United Kingdom universities rank in the top global 200 universities. And in fact, we also have the first and second positions. And more world leaders were educated in those British universities than anywhere else. 58 serving heads of state or heads of government have attended UK universities. And the British uh, World Service, the BBC World Service, is the world's most trusted news provider. While if you're in the US, four out of the 10 most trusted <coughs> sources of news are British. Let's look at the British Council. I think it's an exemplar in 
cultural and educational engagement, and it's no surprise at all that Putin has ordered it to be expelled. And I could go on. I could go on to proclaim the world-leading achievements of our music industry, our theater, our film industries, our museums, our science output, our Olympic and Paralympic teams, and so on. There is no doubt that Britain is a cultural world powerhouse. And that gives us soft power. It gives us the ability to promote values that are, are attractive to other nations and that can influence other nations. Politically, too, I think Britain is a soft power. I think we had begun to carve out a new role for ourselves, Following the retreat from empire and following the repeated humiliations of being relegated to a second partner in the US special relationship, we had actually found a new role for ourselves. We were, and we remain, one of the best connected nations in the world as a member of the G8, as a member of NATO, of the UN Security Council, of the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty non-designated uh, states, as a member of the Commonwealth of Nations. And we'd found an ability to combine that unique network of relationships with our prominent role within the world's largest trading bloc. And I think that gives Britain special influence, in particularly in economic and security and defense spheres. Backing that up, despite funding cuts, the Foreign Office is really a Rolls-Royce service. Our security services, such as MI5, MI6, and GCHQ, are world-class. And particularly, one of the facts I'm proud of is that the UK is one of only six countries where we meet the United Nations commitment to spend 0.7% of our gross national income on foreign development assistance. And globally, we're the second largest international donor after the US. All of these things enable Britain to protect its interest and to project its influence. Now, for those of us who are British or who live here, I think we have an inherent distaste of nationalism and a tendency to self-deprecation. And perhaps sometimes that leaves us feeling rather uncertain or rather queasy about proclaiming how proud we are of this country. But if you think back, and it wasn't long ago, to the opening ceremony of the London 2012 Olympics, I think that ceremony actually quite hit the mark, and it was something which a lot of us felt proud of. The representations of the Industrial Revolution, of the National Health Service, of our literary heritage, our popular music and culture, to us it seemed to sum up Britain's advantages, and it did so with a, with a sense of British sense of humor. And yet, I think it is the case that you now see our cultural and our political influence steadily being drained. We are seen as a less important and a less reliable player. Following the nerve agent attack in Salisbury, EU nations have shown great solidarity for one who is still a member state. But it's clear that our influence in the EU, particularly, for example, on the important issue of sanctions against Russia, is beginning to disappear. And the US response, as we've become recently used to, used to accept, was confusing and half-hearted. Not, not just because the Secretary of State was sacked immediately after giving us support. Um, you, so you often hear this counter-argument, well, security issues are going to be OK because they're a matter for NATO, not the EU. But security is much broader than just military strength. Security now requires a combination of capabilities in the economic spheres, in political, in diplomatic, in intelligence areas, in the cyber area. So Angela Merkel has gone so far as to suggest that Europe now needs to follow its own vision for its future and that the time for relying on the US and the UK is over. And it's hard to disagree with that. And when I travel the world, my colleagues and my friends 
tend to also echo the German Chancellor. They tend to say, has the UK gone mad? It's generally melt, it meant in a, in a kindly and a, and a concerned sense. But, but thus far, I, I, and thus far, I don't think the damage to, to Britain's standing is irreparable, but it certainly is taking place. You can see that Brexit has led to reductions in our diplomatic strength. We've actually begun to withdraw diplomatic presence outside the EU in order to restaff our presence in, in European capitals. And recently, for the first time, we had a failure to secure a seat at the United Nations International Court of Justice. We no longer have a voice at the European Court of Justice. These are symbolic of a continuing loss of UK influence. You see that the United Kingdom Prime Minister and her ministers are shunned at international summits. And she certainly isn't able at the moment to play the sort of role that, for example, the French president is playing. So Salisbury, I think, gives us a glimpse, a glimpse of what geopolitics will be like post-Brexit. We won't be friendless. We won't have lost all power. Uh, it never happens immediately. It never happens dramatically. But our status and our influence is slowly and surely at risk. And the work to redefine what Britain's global strategy is, and particularly to rebuild relations or to build new relations with emerging and fast-growing countries, is going to be a very hard and a very slow road. Let me come back then to, to the economic debate. As I say, I'm not even sure that in the long run this is the most important aspect. But if you look at most respectable forecasts, they tend to be in the same ballpark as the Treasury's own forecast, which was recently linked, uh, leaked um, and can be found on the internet. That forecast sets out two main negative effects of Brexit, reduced access to the EU market through either tariff or non-tariff barriers, and then secondly, reduced migration. And assuming we are leaving the single market, the estimated effect of those two uh, effects combined is a, a loss of GDP of about 5 to 8 five to eight percent over 15 years. And then the analysis says, well, there are counterbalancing positive effects. There's new possibility of new trade deals with non-EU countries, and there's the ability to set our own regulations. But it estimates the effect of those to be only half a percent of GDP. In other words, the negative effects outweigh the positive effects by 10 to 1. Now, if you set that in context, 5 to 8 percent of GDP lost means on average everybody in the UK is £2,000 a year worse off. That is actually only about half the effect that we've seen as a consequence of the last decade of credit crunch and austerity. Um, but I think John Major was absolutely right when he said it, there is no precedent for a government pursuing a policy that knowingly makes the country poorer. And most importantly, I think it's worse if you're in one of the hardest hit areas. I think London will be relatively OK. But the industries which will suffer most, like chemicals or food and drink or automotive or retailing, will suffer more. And areas of the UK which will be hit hardest include the Northeast and the Northwest, West Midlands, and Northern Ireland. So my concern is what this does for social cohesion. If you are someone who, lived, who lives in those industries or in those regions, many of whom, of course, voted to leave because they perceived the current system was already not working for them. What strain does that put on the social fabric, and what strain potentially does it put on our democracy? And coming back to the theme of these islands, it's unclear whether Brexit will lead to the fragmentation of the UK, but it'll certainly put stress, I think, Scotland and Northern Ireland voted to remain. England and Wales voted to leave. 
we're almost inevitably going to find some form of harder border between Northern Ireland and the Republic. And there's no doubt, I think, that some considerable strain will be put on relations between the nations of the United Kingdom as a consequence of Brexit. So all of this we're embarking on, and it's happening in a world where some wish to promote nationalism, to claim purity of cultures, or to deny cosmopolitanism or globalization, or to portray a, a clash of civilizations. Some wish to draw smaller and smaller circles between their definitions of us and them. So it was actually, it was actually, it's a phrase which you hear now, but it was, it was Diogenes, the cynic, actually, who, when first asked where he came from, said, I am a citizen of the world. And I think what he meant by that was that each of us dwells in two communities. We live in the local community of our birth, and we also dwell in the greater community of human aspiration. Right now, I think if you look at the world, it faces immense challenges. It faces challenges such as the need for inclusive growth and for poverty eradication, gender inequality, climate change, security of food, water, natural resources, and the environment. We face a threat of militant Islamist fundamentalism, a return to Cold War geopolitics, and nuclear proliferation to rogue or fragile states. These problems, each of which is immensely more problematic than Brexit, but can only be solved through effective multilateral collaboration. And I think a united Britain as what is one of a small number of countries which actually has the real capacity to influence and has, in my view, an immensely important role to play. In the modern era, nation states are the institutions which have legitimacy and power to change the world for the better. But increasingly, they can only do so by pooling their actions under supernatural, supernational institutions or legal frameworks. So my interpretation of the citizen of the world would be someone who loves her country but loves it by wishing it to live up to global responsibilities. Who sees that her country's power can be shared without being surrendered? And I do hope, quite sincerely, that all of you will stay to help us in Britain live up to those global responsibilities on these islands. Thank you very much.